of the sum of alpha i j b Okay. Now this is a mean and a max, and these are compact convex sets. So you can use von Neumann mean max theorem to extend the truth. I can write that as max over beta and mean over alpha. And finally, here I can again say that, well, this is a minimum on something which is not a simplex but a polytope and of a linear form. So that should again be rich on the vertices. So we end up with saying that this is the max of the sum of minimum over J of Aij because that would correspond to the vertices of my set A. Okay, so it simplified a little. And now there's a next step, which is finding more precisely where this maximum is reached. And what you can prove is the it's written by model methods. So these vectors of the form beta j, which is either zero if j doesn't belong to a certain set, or because we're of the simplex, all the entries are equal and the sum up to one. So it's one over the cardinality of the set j, and j must be non. So then you put this here and working a little bit, you arrive to this expression. If you've ever seen the proof of such a theorem, maybe by different methods, I'm quite interested. The type of situation where we actually apply this it's when you have, um, you want to compute the volume, the Euclidean volume of a cone. You take a positive cone of generated by lambda one lambda d in the dual of Rn. And you only want the vectors Take your cone in a certain way. X is in the octant. So you have that situation. That's your cone with the lambdas. And then you truncate your cone in some way that depends on X by evaluating the linear forms. And if you want to compute this volume up to a certain rational factor. This is going to be so one over d factor. It's a bit like the volume of the simplex up to this factor. And then you will have the product of the lambda r. So this lemma can be applied to say if I know value the x, so I take a slightly different region, I weigh differently these, these rays. Um, and I take the power S of that, is that going to be integrable or not? And the last prelim preliminary remark is that this Euclidean volume, you know, so it's the limit of counting integer points in this cone. So it's the limit of the number of pairs. In integral combinations of the lambdas, but that um, 
L of X smaller than K. So maybe take a very big, you rescale this and you count the number of integral points. By the definition of the Euclidean volume, I remind integration this unit here when you refine the mesh or when you dilate that um, would be exactly the volume. That's always going to appear for us. And now I'm going to describe the geometric problem which we wanted to study. What's that lambda here? Lambda, these are my inner forms. Yeah. Well, FD, but they are so lambdas lambda. are the rays of this cone. And then I just truncate that to a finite region. But for that, I use X. So all of what I do is depending on X, it tells you which exactly region. I would also expect the determinant of lambda to be in the numerator. Why is it in the denominator? Um, because of the volume of the tone with the span of the lambda? Well, you would overcount, I think. Uh, this determinant is related to the number of integer points in the unit region. Uh, okay, but I thought it's just the volume of this, of this uh, truncated cone. Um, but the ends are smaller than one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it should be it's the opposite actually. Yeah. Okay. But but you have specialized to a simplicial cone, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now I want to explain how do you count multiples uh, on hyperbolic surfaces. You take a bordered topological stable surface, so two G minus two plus n is positive. And by simple closed curve, we mean the, um, the proper the isotopy class of the proper embedding of the circle inside the surface. And I don't want them to be homotopic to the boundary So this is a simple curve. Multi curve is just the disunion of simple closed curve, which admit representative that don't pair that pairwise don't intersect. So I can, if I want to repeat this component, or I can take another one here. I take the union. So that's a multi curve. If sigma is the surface, I call M sigma the set of multiverse. And I was going to the empty one. There's no structure. This, this set is infinite. So when we're counting multicurves, we give ourselves a notion of length. And then you want to say how many multicurves have lengths that say smaller than k. And there's many notion of length that you can take. And uh, I will start by describing hyperbolic length. 
So we can take a hyperbolic metric. We draw these boundaries. And that determines for you a notion of length. So we take this isotopy class. And in hyperbolic geometry, is going to be a shortest geodesic representative for it. So the hyperbolic length is the length of this shortest representative. And the question dates back. Uh, there was a big progress done by Miyazaki in the, 2000, in the year 2007. Um, what she showed is that this. Number of non-teachers which have which have length smaller than some k is going to grow with k, but polynomially divide by the polynomial growth. And you want to catch the with the constant prefactor. Going to depend a priori on the hyperbolic metric. But before her work was not clear whether that exists, it was only known that there was a polynomial upper bound of this type. So we have any proof that this exists. And actually, it's a continuous proper function on the modular space. So it depends on the it exists. Modelized space of, of hyperbolic metrics with the boundaries, uh, modulo diffeomorphisms on the surface. What is the L in the modular space? The capital Sorry? L. Where? What, what is, is this? L, the capital L in the modulus. L is the boundary length. So, strictly speaking, is a honey prove this result for uh, puncture surface surfaces. So, zero length, but you can extend it to more surfaces. And this function has some and you're interested in this function when you want to study random hyperbolic surfaces uh, for reasons related to dynamics uh, of the Teichmuller flow. So many people for different reasons are interested in, in this function. So the first question is okay, does this exist? So can you compute it? So it's a problem. Compute B. And it's totally open, even for the simplest case, which will be the torus with one number, or even with a puncture. So, in your favorite set of coordinates, whether coming from the character variety description or the John Nielsen description, find a way to compute this. There's on the modelized space of hyperbolic surfaces, there is a, a volume form which is a by Peterson volume. So, what you really have here in dynamics actually is integrals against the by Peterson volume form of this function B. I would say that. And one norm for this for a wide Peterson measure. Um, so this is finite. In fact, this can be computed in many different ways. It's one of So you cannot compute B explicitly, you can compute in many different ways the L1 norm explicitly. It's not the topic of my talk. 
is related to the so called laser bridge board. In fact, if you want to look at the LS norm, there was a recent paper by Atreya Havana Herrera that say that this is finite in it and only if S is smaller or equal to two. And the way this is proved is by actual, you can find lower and upper bounds quite explicit for this function. Problem that okay, so you know this is this function is L2. Can you compute the L2? It's related to the question of computing. If you take a random surface and a random nozzle curve, um, can you compute the second moment? So compute the L2 norm is also totally open. So I'm not going to solve this problem, it's still open. However, I'm going to replace it by a problem which turns out to be simpler and more, not hyperbolic, but combinatorial. So in algebraic geometry, sometimes it's better to think of tropical limits, tropical curves to study algebraic geometry problems. And in fact, there is a, I would say it's the, the combinatorial geometry based on ribbon graphs is a sort of tropical version of the hyperbolic geometry. So three probability curves. On combinatorial surfaces. I have my L, which is the boundary at the body surfaces. And I'm only looking at border surface. Actually, I don't want close surface. In many ways, when the boundary length becomes infinite, upper body surfaces look like metric ruben blocks. It has various precise incarnations. Um, so I'm going to define T com sigma kind of isotopy classes of proper embeddings. Of the graph G to sigma so that the graph is at least trivalent so we don't want bivalent vertices i want this graph to be metric and 
and I want the surface to retract from the graph. It looks like this. Here's a sphere with four boundaries. And so I'm going to try to draw a ribbon graph satisfying this. Here, a traveling vertex. You go behind here. And you do this, this is homotopic. This retracts to here. This retracts to here, and so on. And I want to consider this picture up to homotopy or isotopy. And it's metric. So at the end, what remains when you look at homotopy, homotopy classes is just length on these edges. Etc. You can define the boundary length by saying, for example, if this is L1. Well, when I homotop that on the graph, I'm going to see a e. Maybe I'm missing an edge. Yeah, the upper one. So this thing here. So when I do this, yeah. So I'm missing the f, and so l one is going to be a plus f, for instance. Here you have six letters, so it depends on six parameters. There is four boundary lengths, so remain only two free viable. That's indeed the dimension you expect for the moduli space of a sphere with four boundaries. It's fixed boundary length. So, how to make the way to make this thing precise was the relation to hyperbolic geometry is that it's in fact a homeomorphism. Between the usual touch with a space and this combinatorial touch with a space. So, this is called a spine. And what does it do if I take a hyperbolic metric here? The spine of sigma is going to be the set of points. Take with distance in at least two ways. Of boundary of sigma for the metric small sigma. So if you think of it as a hyperbolic surface, there are points here which are equidistant to this boundary and this boundary. And if I move a little. That's going to draw an edge. And at some point, I'm going to reach a point with equidistant to three boundaries. For example, this. So this draws an embedded graph, which is metric because the surface was metric. It just inherits the metric from the restriction of the hyperbolic metric to the graph. And so this is a theorem, uh, not by us. Um, That um, this graph actually, the surface retracts on this graph. And it defines a homomorphism which is compatible with the mapping class group. So it descends to the homomorphism of the moduli spaces. However, the inverse map is pretty complicated. One doesn't understand that very well. It's not explicit. Now, I can start with a hyperbolic metric. And I want to consider the flow, which is called a, which was introduced by Bolich Epstein. So it's a rescaling flow. If I take a hyperbolic surface, I cannot rescale the length of all curves at the same time. It's not the geometric flow that does that. 
Uh, however, what I can do is I go to this file and then I just scale all the length of edges to this file. We just change the metric on the ground. So I go in T comp boundary length theta L. And I can come back to the fine inverse. And I go to the type from the space of algebraic metric is boundary length beta. And this map here, I want to denote rho beta. So the facts are that if you look at sigma it's this metric, so I rescale length by by beta, it's going to converge. So this is a metric space, is going to converge when beta goes to infinity to the metric ribbon graph. So the surface here. The hyperbolic surface under this flow is going to squeeze. There's almost no area here to just squeeze to the graph. And that's for the ground of Hausdorff metric. If you look at the length of any curve, so it doesn't rescale exactly all the lengths, but it's asymptotically. Behaves as the length of the curve on the spine. So here I already say what's the hyperbolic length. So what is the length of a curve on the spine? I have my curve, um, I take a representative, representative of my um, isotopic class of simple curves curve. And because the surface retracts on the graph, I can just homotopy it to the graph. And then I just see how many times it crosses, it, it goes along this edge, and I add up the sum of length of edges along the graph. And there's a unique way to do that in non backtracking way. So somehow you take the minimum representative of the curve on the graph, and that's give you the length. And there's a last fact, which is that was for a given hyperbolic structure. But I want when I want to consider things in family, I know on the moduli space I have the Weil Peterson measure. So I should be able to compare how the Weil Peterson measure behaves under this flow uh, with a natural measure on the combinatorial moduli space. And so this is was proven by Van Bello. But up to a rescale natural rescaling factor, pull back the Valpedison measure here. And there's a natural measure uh, which was defined by Komsevich on the combinatorial moduli space. Um, and this converges pointwise to one. So what is this measure on the commercial moduli space? This is simply the union of all ribbon graphs of a metric on the ribbon graph divided by automorphisms. 
it's almost true. The only thing that remains that you will need to fix the boundary. Fixing non parameters of boundaries. So you cut this out by applying hypotenuse. So in particular, it's going to be up to a factor. Um, there's going to be a Euclidean measure on this, and there's a Kontsevich measure. It's up to a known factor. Instead of trying to solve the problem of hyperbolic surface of counting multi curves, I want to count multi curves with respect to combinatorial lengths. And I would like to see what is the analog of this. So, first, can we compute the B comp? I'm going to define B comp point in the combinatorial modular space. I take the length of a representative here in the traditional space. So the first result is that it exists. The second thing that one can actually compute it is what I'm going to try to explain. And then, in fact, there's an, you can really study the integrability quite explicitly. How much time is remaining? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. So we want to compute the number of multi curves that have lengths in the ribbon graph. We fix a ribbon metric ribbon graph that have lengths smaller than k. So we need a combinatorial description of multi curves that use the information of the graph. So first, whenever you have a simple closed curve or a multi curve, which is just a union of those, you can try to homotopy close to the graph. And I'm going to fix the G, which is rather than to simplify this. So I'm bound to understand these local pictures. Here's a piece of the surface. My ribbon graph looks like this. So these are boundaries. And well, this is just a piece of the surface, and it continues, it flows up to boundaries and so on. And that's the ribbon graph. So I take the multi curve and I can homotopy to the graph. It means that here I'm going to have some strands. And to really know the multi curve, I have to know how things connect here. So let's say here that I have a certain number xe, xe prime, and xe e prime prime. In fact, there's only, there's at most one way to connect so that you get something which is simple that don't is exactly set. So it looks like this. I could do that. And here I'm forced to do that. There's no other way, otherwise, I have to cross. So, more generally, um, then you would have opposite to here. You have to say, equivalently, you can encode this in how many of these strands are connecting this to this. Uh, how many strands are connecting this to this? So it's opposite to E, so you know that YE. And how many strands are connecting this to this? Y. So obviously, we must have that XE, how many strands are going here? And they come from there, so it's YE prime. All they come from here, so it's YE prime. prime. And well, I could also cyclically prime the role of E, E prime, E prime prime.
and so on this linear system. And then you would find that y e I must mistake and the CQ presentations. So you see that you cannot choose when can you really connect things. It's when these y's are integers, non-negative integers. But it gives some divisibility condition for these combinations here, and positivity condition. So I would like to say that this is the set of x's. There's one x for each. And I must have that for each corner. So the corner was here. Delta, the corresponding y delta should be an integer. So that's a lot of um, conditions. But it's not quite true because when we do this, we could have a curve that, okay, so here we only connect here, we only connect here, we have a component that just goes around here. That would represent a simple closed curve, which is homotopic to this boundary. And that happens when I don't have a stop. Here, there's at least one that continues around. If you want to forbid the situation, you have to say that there exists for each face, there exists a corner with y delta zero around that face. There is no components going to circle around. Okay, so this condition, if now I rather consider not integers but positive real numbers, um, if I didn't have that, that would be um, some polyhedron, and now that's a union of poly polyhedral cone. And then, so one can really prove is a bijection. So our goal is to compute this, is the number of integral points in the union of these polyhedral cones. Therefore, when you take the limit, by definition of the Euclidean measure, that should actually be the Euclidean volume of this. So B comp is a Euclidean volume. A union of cones subjected to the condition, so the length of the corresponding curve. So, in terms of the coordinate axes, so when you have integer, that's the number of strands I have. So, the contribution to the length of the multiple of these strands is xe times the length of the edge in the graph. So that's when I compute the measure points. If I want the volume, I just truncate. Just allow that to be positive numbers, and this must be smaller than one. So this can be computed pretty explicitly. In fact, this description is explicit. You can put it on a computer that's going to give you a simplicial decomposition in simplicial cones of this. And so you're going to be able to express this as a sum over the simplicial cones of factors of 
Dimension that is in volume of simplices. And then you would have here a product of, so I would write like this um, R in the rays of this simplicial code, which form the decomposition. You have many of them. And then you would have what? You would have um, R. And it's exactly six G minus six plus two n of those. They're linear independent. Uh, so that's for that you have to work a bit, but that's concrete. So the problem here of computing is solved. And um, then the question is what about integrability? So let me recall the situation. You have here the modular space. The modular space is a union of over ribbon graphs of the polyhedron. Let's say, well, you have length on the edges and the sum up to the parameter that you gave yourself, which is in L. So there are various cells here. You give me a metric ribbon graph in here. There is above that multi curves. And I decompose it into simplicial cones, so something like this, and then well maybe something like this, or probably drawing it back. So that's one cone, it's another one, and so on. And depending on the point here, which gives length to edges, you're going to truncate this, and you want to compute the volume of that. That's the volume here is the value of B comp at this point. And now you want to integrate that volume function against the Euclidean measure here. So it's another polyhedral decomposition. And what happens, so this depends on the length of edges, how you measure these rays. But you see that you may have problems when, so some edge can, edge length can shrink. In the metric group, you can go from trivalent to four valent or higher. So some edges can shrink. But that means that some rays uh, actually can also have zero length. So some of those could go to zero, some may not, but some could go to zero. So that's responsible for divergences of this function at the boundaries of the cells. <coughs> so responding to a certain graph. And at the boundary where you shrink one edge, this function may diverge. So it's not obvious how does it diverge, how many factors do not diverge. And therefore, it's not totally obvious how to say is that LS or which S. <laughs> Here is the, the main theorem, which tell you exactly for which S E call is LS for this Euclidean measure, so the Konsevich measure. And the surprise that it depends on the topology, on the genus and number of boundary. First information, it's always smaller than two. With zero three, there's no other multi curve than the empty one, so it's not interesting. But if you do zero four, the sphere with four boundaries, here with five boundaries, the torus with one boundary, 
here the value is two. It's not L2, but it's L as for any S2 is smaller than two. Then it becomes less integral. N is bigger than six. One third plus two third one over integral part of n over two minus two. And bigger than two doesn't depend on number of boundaries, it's four thirds. G bigger than two and one boundary is one plus one over three, G minus three. General case remaining is one plus one over three. G minus one. So what happens? Why is it so different between hyperbolic and, and combinatorial? Well, the key difference between hyperbolic geometry and the geometry of ribbon graph, which is some of flat geometry. In hyperbolic geometry, short curves cannot intersect because of the color length. Therefore, if you were seeing something like this. In hyperbolic geometry, imagine that's length of curves. When they become short, so when some of them go to zero, there cannot be too many that go to zero at the same time. On ribbon graphs, it doesn't happen. You can have more than 3G minus 3 plus n curves that go to zero simultaneously. So because there's no color lemma, you can expect Less but with respect to this picture, we seem to say that everything from hyperbolic converge to this combinatorial geometry. So you could say, well, I want to integrate over beta L, the function we hit, the hyperbolic one, you can provide Peterson. If I restate that properly, let's come from the scaling here of length and there was also the, the form the vital symbolic form which was in scaling. So it's exactly using this pullback change of variable. It's exactly the integral over n sigma com of so this of um, so rho beta. Against and so each measure put that to the S, and then there will be a Jacobian, which is a change of measure from Vipedus, the pullback of Vipedus into the Euclidean measure. And what the claims here say, and the other one I wrote, is that this Jacobian tends to one point wise. And this function um, tends to be calm. You can compare hyperbolic tank and combinatorial tank. It's uniform enough for that thing to be to be correct. And that's uniformly It's not enough. If you want to say that, well, I can take the beta limit inside here, so I can say, how well, does that behave for very large boundary lengths? You need some domination assumption to apply dominated convergence, and that you don't have. So, this is a sign that at least for as bigger than those values, between two and those values, okay, we have this conversion, but it's not, if you have an effective upper bound, it's not going to be integrable enough to guarantee the limit commute with the integral. 
which in particular means that for very large boundary lengths, if S is smaller than SGN, you expect that this thing is going to grow polynomially with beta or decay according to this particular power. But it's not going to be true. It's going to be actually larger for SGN. So this result tells you that there's something strange happening for very large hyperbolic for the function to become for very large hyperbolic lengths. So the reason I started with the lemma, and we conclude maybe two minutes, now, okay. is that if you want to analyze so exactly how this theorem is proved, so you have the s power of this. It's not hard to believe by element to estimate that integrability of this is going to be the same integrability of this to the power x. And then you have to understand which rays actually can have a length going to zero. For this, you would start with your, you are in a certain cell here, and you will start to a, a vertex of this polyhedron, which give the cells, and look at the neighborhood. If you're exactly at the vertex, it means that there's going to be 6g minus 6 plus 2n of the 6g minus 6 plus 3n edges, whose length is going to zero. So if I try to draw a graph, for example, I can try this. So in white is going to be the edges of zero length at the boundary of the cell. But not all edges can be zero because you have positive boundary lengths. So you must have around each face some positive length that remain that account for the length of the boundaries. So here I drew a graph where these things all get contracted and the remaining boundary lengths are all located in orange pieces. So you have to understand among those things, or for any possible simplex, simplex, simplex that comes in the decomposition of the set of multi curves, you have to consider which of these boundary of cells, so which of these wide graphs inside the bigger graph can lead to the worst divergence. So if we had a very simple integral and for which power is integrable, which would just be power counting. In that case, it's replaced by the integrability lemma that I showed at the beginning. It's exactly on this point. I can, in fact, prove geometrically that these things are positively. And you have to analyze for, you have to find the worst divergent graphs. And you can do that. And that leads finding for a fixed GN, which are the worst graph that leads you after some work. I will stop next time. All right, thank you. So, questions or remarks? I have a question and a remark. So, the remark is you mentioned that you, that you have this uh, difference between the combinatorial space and the, and the actual space. There is this paper by Penner and McShane, which looks at, at these uh, screens on fat graphs, which tell you sort of what curves can become smaller in terms of uh, polynomial groupoids and coordinates. Maybe that helps. I don't know if you look at that. So, one uh, thing, so we looked at various papers of Bob actually for uh, to study this combinatorial type. I must say that it's somehow this is not exactly the same space. Also, many things are similar with these measured foliations and so on. Sometimes it's not exactly the same spaces. Um, so, I think this particular paper, maybe I didn't look at it, but uh, I will have a look. Uh, so I would say all what concerns the description of the set of measured. Um, so here, when you tensor by R plus, it's measured foliations. Yeah. So this description, there is absolutely no claim. It's, it's classical. We just had to redo it for a purpose, but this is totally classical. Um, there's nothing new here. Um, what we do somehow is to analyze also the description of the rays to say um, the rays are supported, for example, like simple loops and dumbbells. Things like this. This is also classical. 
There's nothing new here. So the only new part is really the analysis of this integrability. Right, and then the question is, so, so you have these things you mentioned, uh, I think you've said something weird is going on, but uh, so you have these numbers, do they tell me something or? But I mean, I, I know you wanted these numbers. I, I, would, like to, I, them and then I would, would like to understand, ask you the next I can tell you what are the worst. So yeah. what you do to, to, to prove these numbers, you just write, um, look, try to restrict the set of words diverging graph. And then actually see that these things do, are realized by a certain worst graph. Okay. So I can tell you which are the boundary of cells that contribute to this, which are the, the graphs, the white and orange. Mm -hmm. Whether I can interpret this, I mean, ideally what I would like is to have effective bound on this comparison, this Jacobian between Weil Peterson and Komsevich, so Euclidean, to have an effective upper bound, which you can prove is integrable if and only if S is smaller than this, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very far from what term. Thank you. So there was a comment by Francis, uh, who's not in Zoom anymore. So um, he just referred to it as an old paper by Atia about, uh, I think it's, it's the one about division of distributions mm -hmm. where he studies more or less exactly this integrability uh -huh. problem for general, uh, I think, polynomial denominators. So uh, I'm aware of some results for this polynomial, I mean, polynomial thing, but here it's very specific. It's not an arbitrary polynomial. It's product of linear forms. And so the result is, uh, I think, a bit more specialized. It's right. not as general uh, as this thing, but so we could extract the special the from the general polynomials. Thing. So I guess if you take the linear case, well, I don't know. So, mm -hmm. Yes, so I think we couldn't extract from the general okay. results yeah. on this polynomial thing exactly that thing. Okay. And maybe a simple question but is there a, a combinatorial argument why the n only shows up in g equals zero n no, greater I don't than know. five? Yeah, okay. Um, so the way it works, I can tell you what are the words I've written graph. I yeah. can prove that the others, no matter how many boundaries you have, is not going to. Yeah. To, to matter. But yeah, it would be nice to have a better interpretation of this pattern. Um, Questions from Zoom? Um, can you describe what are the worst graphs? Yes. Okay. So genus zero and higher genus is uh, slightly different. And in genus zero, this would be, so white is what can vanish. It could be things like this. So I go last, I got like that before. So you just have this kind of trunk and then um, it's all the loops and then you need, to, that needs to be the, um, Graph that has positive boundary length. So you have something like this. And so the way you do it is that first you try to draw a yellow, uh, a white graph of things that vanish. And then, so that has a certain topology. And then you try to add the orange things and see to which GN is going to contribute. So this is for probably N even <coughs> and G is zero. And for the others in higher genus, you can do this kind of strands of genus G times and then well the positive length must be somewhere so here it is. And then you do some sort of alternating elastic loop. And so on. So that works for GB curve. Bizarre. 
Yes. <laughs> Maybe others. I'm just saying these one realized the, the worst, but there yeah. may be other graphs that realize the worst as well. Thanks. So, so you, 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 you pulled out the beam to the left in a sense, right? And yes. The best thing to the right. But then you still have some residual penis on your target as well. No, here it's because all genus like, zero. Oh, okay, that's zero. Because yeah, G if you go to one, it's just saying for the total. Right, right. Okay, so you, you just move. I have G on those guys. Yeah, that's not too bad because you're just sliding hanging on the top. Exactly. It's smaller. So in genus zero, it's not so uniform, but in higher genus, it's uniform. It's, it's not that bad. It could be there's many more actually graphs that contribute to the same order. Uh, but at least those ones realize the maximum. Right. Um, um, is there other questions? So that's fine. Uh, we are done again.